Michael. We have some news from Kiev. Violence continues this morning oh. in Kiev's Independence Square. There are reports of more dead protesters. NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel is live in Ukraine's capital. Richard. Uh, good morning, Mike. We've been watching this unfold all day. And uh, last night in this square, there had been reports that there would be a truce, that the government had promised not to invade the camp, the protest camp, where you can hear the protesters speaking on loudspeakers behind me, and that the riot police would be pulled back. This morning, that truce seemed like it was being put into action. <coughs> Buses showed up to take the riot police away. And as the riot police were getting onto their buses, the demonstrators attacked them with Molotov cocktails and fireworks. We could see all of this take place. And then the riot police started to open fire. Around 9 a.m. in Kiev, riot police retreated from their positions. In pursuit with the anti-government protesters now advancing out of their fortified camp. We watched at least one policeman dragged away. The protests had been contained. Suddenly, they'd broken out of the square and into the side streets. Retreating under attack, police got much more violent, and protesters started dropping, carried away to any shelter the demonstrators could find. Many claimed government forces are now using snipers, too. Protesters have turned this hotel lobby into a field hospital. The injured are still streaming in. We've seen volunteers using bed sheets to try and treat the wounds. And some of the injuries at least appear to have come from live ammunition. The hotel lobby quickly turned into mayhem. No supplies had been stored here. The injured given care on the floor. We watched at least three protesters die. By afternoon, protesters were spreading across downtown Kiev, and a reported truce appeared over even before it began. The riot police have now withdrawn, and the demonstrators are spreading out beyond the square, occupying the positions that had been held by the riot police, and really expanding the area in Kiev held by the opposition. Richard Engel, live in Kiev. Thank you very much, Richard. Senator Portman. Uh... What about this? I mean, there have been, uh, Nicole read uh, yeah. the, the op-ed from, who was it this morning? Pete Weiner wrote an op-ed, um, really, really tough on President Obama, saying that um, his uh, failure to enforce his own red line in Syria basically renders him impotent in this crisis. And I wondered if Republicans shared that sentiment and would articulate that e even at, at an hour like this. Yeah, look, I, I think we're in a weaker position all around the world. Uh, this morning I got up to read some headlines about how now Japan is upset with us, one of our you know, great allies in, in, in the Asia Pacific area. And I can't think of a single place in the world where we're better off today than we were four years ago. And part of it is this lack of resolve, the sense the United States is not going to be there for their allies. Mm -hmm. And if we're not there for our allies, uh, our enemies notice that. Mm -hmm. And um, so look, it's, it's, this is very concerning. We, we happen a lot of, have a lot of Ukrainians in Ohio, I mean, Ukrainian Americans, and I'm on this issue, been actually, uh, talking to some folks back home who have relatives there. Um, the United States needs to step up and be counted. Senator, that w we talked about this earlier. On the flip side of that, that's all ideologically great. Mm -hmm. We're coming off Iraq, we're coming off of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Is there a reality to the fact that we cannot emotionally or financially weather being the world's police officer anymore? And all we can do is bark, and the very thing we're criticizing Obama for is not a reflection of democratic policies, but a reflection of where we stand in the world community and the realities we have as a country right now. Donnie, two things. One, uh, when you say something as America, you need to stand behind it. So when we draw a red line, we need to stand behind it. That's not about having more or less military power. It's being consistent, and we have not been consistent, whether it's Syria or, or whether, again, if you look at what's going on in the Asia Pacific area, there are folks who are not sure we're going to be with them. But second, the United States has a huge role to play. We are the largest economy in the world. Um, I look at the commercial side as well as the military side. As the former U.S. trade representative, I'm amazed that for seven years we haven't been able to negotiate any trade agreements. This is one of the issues. We're on the sidelines. People are saying, gosh, where's America? I guess I need to deal more with China on a commercial basis because I don't see the United States expanding trade. Um, and on the military side, uh, you're right. People have a lot of war fatigue, and understandably, we still have a bigger military than all of our competitors combined, and we still have the ability to keep the sea lanes open, the South China Sea and the Suez Canal and so on. We've got to be sure that we're, you know, we're 
our, our presence is known and that we're involved. If we're not involved, uh, things tend to get very chaotic very quickly, and you see that in the Middle East right now. So I think the U.S. role in the world is diminished, and I think you know we're going to start to suffer more and more from it. But what should we do in Ukraine? I hear you, and I, 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 I think there's probably a hybrid answer between the two of you guys, but what, what should be our course of action in Ukraine in response to this commentary and what we will expect to be more commentary about what the president's doing and what this administration is not doing? Yeah, look, I, I think we need to stand uh, with people who are supporting democracy and freedom, and that, that's, a, that's a red line that we've drawn historically. Um, George Bush used to talk about this, not as something that comes from the United States or some other country. It's, you know, it's people's right uh, from their creator to have freedom and, and, and liberty and be able to hold elections. And, and much of what's happening here, I think, is reflective of what's happened in other places around the world where you've got demonstrators saying, hey, we just you know, want, want to have an opportunity to be heard and have real democracy. And we got to stand with them.